Things off. Sorry. So start again. Good morning. Good afternoon. It's a pleasure to talk to you a little bit about prevention and early detection of gastric cancer. Okay. Now the problem of how does it work? Okay. Gastric cancer, as has as uh, the previous speaker said, is a one of the leading cancers, especially is a third cancer in mortality, particularly in men, with almost a million deaths a year. And there is a very clearly an equal distribution of gastric cancer around the world. It is very common in some parts of South America, it's very co uh, but also in some parts of Europe, particularly Eastern Europe. Of course, uh, it includes Russia and China, and the highest rates by, by far are in uh, in Japan and South Korea. So this is it, it's a highly variable cancer. Uh, so this one was already shown. It, uh, it's a, 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 in terms of mortality, stomach cancer accounts for about 10% of all of all cancer deaths. This is this shows the the extreme inequalities that have been reported between registra registries. For example, about 65 in Korea compared to about two in some areas in Africa. So it's about a 35 fold uh, difference in risk. It's quite a quite a uh, very interesting uh, phenomenon that that mean is also pointing to etiologic clues. Uh, this is the case of Russia. We can see that there are also extreme variations in, in the incidence with some areas in the, in the northeast, probably Inuit populations that have very, very high rates. Some are other, other areas in the north, also very high, and in, also in the south, in, uh, near the border with Mongolia, while there are other areas which have relatively low rates. In general, stomach cancer has been declining, and that is a, that's a very well-established fact in, in all registries, in all the populations. And uh, this, is, this one shows Russia. This is a, Dr. Sidersky uh, gave me access to these slides, and you can see Russia somewhere there, the red one. It's coming down very, very importantly, both in incident, both in men and women, and also for uh, incidence and mortality. And these are the other countries there. However, the global burden of disease, and probably even the local burden of disease, is not going. To, is not expected to decline for several decades because of what has been discussed. The median age of the population, the increasing age of the population. This is a a cancer that is particularly related with older age. And so the older the populations, the more we're going to have in terms of burden of disease. Uh, this is the, especially in less developed regions where the population will be, I mean, in more developed population has already aged, but in less developed is going to only now uh, start expanding the numbers of older than 65-year-old people, and therefore more susceptible people to developing cancer. Uh, these are predictions of, of gastric cancer from 2012 to 2030. Uh, sorry. And we can see that uh, if even, even if we put the re continued reduction of about 2% annual percent change, minus 2%, Despite the declining uh, incidence rates, we're still going to see the same number, about 1 million new cases by 2030. Now, if uh, I, I put this back just to, so that you can see and uh, make a note that the male and female ratio everywhere is about 50%. Uh, the, the females have about 50% the incidence of males, twice the incidence in males. That is, a, that is a clear phenomenon that has not been properly explained. There are some data showing that uh, there is a hormonal influence in soma cancer that could explain this difference. For example, uh, there is a reduced risk of soma cancer in, in association with the years of fertility and also with the use of uh, hormone replacement therapy. They seem to be protective to some extent against stomach cancer. So 
That's important. There is another phenomenon that is always discussed, is that as gastric cancer declines, esophageal adenocarcinoma increases. And that's a pretty clear, uh, also pretty clear phenomenon. Uh, the place, this is uh, esophageal adenocarcinoma, uh, and this is how it shows how it's increasing, mainly in areas where gastric cancer is declining. Uh, there is two possibilities to explain this after, after for example, when, when helicobacter is not, not present, there is the more likely that there is obesity, and obesity induces more reflux. Uh, on the one hand, and that may, may be the, the explanation for the increased adenocarcinoma of the esophagus, which is the distal esophagus, but mainly it is that also that helicobacter, which we're going to discuss in a minute, uh, induces atrophy, and atrophy reduces the acidity of the stomach. And in case of uh, elimination of the acidity, I mean, sorry, in case of treatment of helicobacter or non-existing of helicobacter, there is more acid that also damages the esophagus. Uh, so what are the main risk factors for stomach cancer? Uh, stomach cancer is one of the infection-related cancers, uh, together with uh, the ones that we, have that we have discussed, liver cancer and all the hepatitis viruses. Uh, cervix and no genital cancers, nasopharynx with, uh, with HPV, of course, nasopharynx with EBV, uh, all the others HPV-related, uh, HIV-related cases, other viruses, and, uh, of course, Helicobacter pylori. Helicobacter pylori is, uh, has been classified as a, as a type 1 carcinogen. Uh, and based on the, based on the different uh, uh, methodologies, including the classification, literature review, and looking at the estimates of new cancer cases, there was uh, these estimations of the cancers attributable to specific infections. And we can see that Helicobacter is responsible for about 800,000 cases, uh, which is about 90% of all stomach cancers. Uh, more than HPV, more than all the cases caused by HPV together, according to these estimates from IARC. Uh, and this is the, the, the estimates on the cancers that are attributable to infections. We can see that in, in, in Southeast Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa and a little bit in Latin America, the fraction that's attributable to infections in general is higher compared to the, to the countries in, in Europe and, and North America and Australia, the more, the more developed countries, in relation to the previous presentation, of course. Now, as I said, H. pylori causes 90% of non-cardia non gastric cancer. It's a bacterium that infects the stomach, usually very, in, in very early ages, transmitted probably through either contact with, with siblings or, or, or relatives or maybe through water as well, uh, that stays, causes an infection that stays in the stomach for the entire life of the individuals. Uh, it, it has a, a very, it is very widespread and it's very common in most populations, particularly in the older cohorts. And in reality, the, the, the prevalence of Helicobacter does not correlate very well with the incidence of gastric cancer in the sense that, of course, if there is no helicobacter, there is no gastric cancer. But there are many places where helicobacter is very high, but they have low gastric cancer, which, as is the case of Africa. And this led to this notion of the African enigma. Why is there so much helicobacter, but people don't develop cancer? Of course, this, there is discussion about all this, but uh, we cannot go into that at this point. So this is the, the pathway, the, what is called the Correa pathway. This is Dr. Pelayo Correa is a pathologist who described this, this pathway for, for development of cancer. It's the Correa cascade. You go from a normal mucosa that is infected with helicobacter, and then you develop superficial gastritis. Over time, it becomes chronic gastritis that leads then to atrophy of the mucosa and eventually to intestinal metaplasia, dysplasia, and uh, adenocarcinoma. Different pathways exist for the infection. In some cases, it can also cause peptic ulcer. Uh, most, in most instances, it's 
asymptomatic all your life and nothing happens. But, but it also can cause mild lymphoma, a type of lymphoma that is completely treatable with treatment for helicobacter. So this it has followed several pathways and the explanation for why it goes in one direction or the, or the other is not very clear. There are very, some very well-established virulence, virulence factors. The most, the most well-known are the CAGA pathogenicity island and the, and the VACA cytotoxin with different subtypes. And within these, there are particular subtypes of the subtypes. And there are many, many other virulence factors that are under investigation. And fortunately, none of these uh, is really useful in, uh, for in clinical practice to determine who each of the infections are more likely to to progress to to a, to a gastric cancer so we are still ha we still haven't found the hpv 16 of, of of helicobacters or other types uh, then the the best established environmental factors are smoking salt alcohol and preserved foods these are uh, in the in the more recent review of the World Cancer Research Fund, they they come up with this as the as the of the ones having the, mo the the best evidence. Although it is not yet even conclusive evidence, no. Well, pointing to the difficulty sometimes of of establishing environment, I mean dietary habits as as risk factors, and there is also a series of genetic factors. Especially, there has been a lot of discussion about genetic polymorphisms of the interleukins that induce people tend to induce to have stronger reactions, immune reactions to Helicobacter, and therefore causing more damage to the mucosa in response to the presence of Helicobacter. But the results in reality have, I mean, with, with repeated studies, have become quite inconsistent, unfortunately. So what can we do to prevent gastric cancer? There may be, there's the possibility of reducing, reducing risk factors, for example, reducing consumption of salt that has additional benefits as well for, the, for prevention of other problems, reductions in meat that also is beneficial for several other reasons, and it's, uh, it's also considered a, a possibly a carcinogen, as well as redu reduction of alcohol. All, all those general interventions also would help reduce gastric cancer. And the other, the most important, is the possibility of eradicating Helicobacter pylori or, or treating Helicobacter pylori. We normally call, use the word eradication. Uh, on the other hand, we have the possibility of doing screening and treatment of early cancers. Uh, can be with X-ray examinations or endoscopy. And of course, always early detection and treatment. And there is a series of warning signs that point to the possibility of having a cancer. But of course, usually those happen when the disease is quite advanced. This is a highly lethal disease. Most people with gastric cancer die uh, more than 80% mortality. Now, once it is clear that Helicobacter can be treated with a combination of antibiotics and proton pump inhibitors. This is the real hundreds or thousands of publications that have shown that you can treat Helicobacter, and there some treatments are highly effective. We, had a, we conducted a study in seven sites in Latin America uh, where we randomized to three different treatments, triple, sequential, and concomitants with different antibiotics and different uh, schedules. I'm not going into details, but you can see that about more than close to 80% of people, between 70 and 80% of the people got the bacterium eradicated. In reality, the, the ideal eradication is even higher than that, at least 80, 85%. And sometimes you have to treat and retreat in case the, 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 the eradication is not successful. Now, uh, on the other hand, there are several trials that have looked at the impact of mass eradication or, or eradication in, at the, at the, in trials uh, to prevent gastric cancer, long-term studies that treated and, and fall, I mean, did randomize to treatment or no treatment and followed long-term. And overall, the, 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 there is a, a potential for prevention of about 30 to 40 percent. The, there is a pooled analysis that was done. There, in reality, they, we don't have many trials. The number of the number of events in the trials is relatively low. If you look at 
the number of events. It's, it's, it's really a handful in all these, in all the studies, in the meta-analysis, and we don't have many new results. Uh, and it's a, there is a, but, but the overall effect is about 0.66, about 34% overall reduction in risk of gastric cancer in the eradicated groups. However, there is still a lot of areas of uncertainty. These studies are all, all done in, basically done in China, most of them. Uh, we don't know if they, they mean if the results are going to be applica applicable. We, one of the main aspects is the age group and the presence of precursors already when you eradicate. So when is it most effective? We need to know what are the best ages to, to decide on treatment. Because at some ages, the prevalence of atrophy may be too high for the, for the intervention to really prevent gastric cancer. That has, there's a lot of discussions about the, what they call a point of no return. Uh, and on the other hand, the younger you go, you can have the benefit of not only preventing cancer in the people treated, but also preventing transmission to the children. So there is this, this, uh, there is the discussion, but there is no data basically on different age groups. Uh, that's what I said, the impact in the presence of gastritis. Now we, we know very little in terms of implementation of such a program, acceptability, feasibility, and then recurrence and reinfection and potential adverse consequence. And that's one of the main reasons, because despite all this knowledge, there is a lot of reluctance to start programs everywhere. And there's basically no country has started any eradication program. And in, in large part, because of the potential for adverse consequence. Because it, in, in reality, it has proven in the data show that it's it would be highly cost effective for sure, even with this limited uh, preventive effort, because it's a one time, very inexpensive intervention. And what are the potential adverse consequences? One of them is the development of adenocarcinoma uh, of the esophagus, but the rates of, 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 of adenocarcinoma of the esophagus are much, much lower than gastric cancer. Uh, then there have been discussions about development of asthma or other immune conditions, weight gain, but the most important is antibiotic resistance. There's the fear because in many populations, about up to 80% of the population is infected. So this would require treatment with a long course of antibiotics, so strong antibiotics for, for a long, I mean, a relatively long period, about 10 or 15 days. And then the risk of development of antibiotic resistance. But of course, there is a lot of debate about this because, I mean, there is much more exposure to buy antibiotics from many other sources where it doesn't have any impact, where it's not useful at all. But this is really, I mean, if it's medically justified, there should be use. And also, there are antibi antibiotics that can be used that are not necessarily, that is, for which either there is no resistance or for which, or, or that are antibiotics that are no longer crucial for, for treatment of, of important diseases. Uh, and then the other concern is alterations in the microbiota and potential uh, consequences of that. But that has been shown also to be a, a transient phenomenon. As I said, the cost effectiveness, uh, it seems to be cost effective, but it's mainly based on observational data. Uh, and it mean, it doesn't include, in general, the benefits of uh, the additional benefits, for example, improvement in treatments, dyspepsia, etc., or potential adverse events. That's not taken into account in the in the cost-benefit analysis. Uh, and then there is not, not much data from developing countries. So we had a meeting in 2013 where we brought all the experts from all over the world to discuss what to do about hel helicobacter eradication, if we should intervene to immediately, for example, and, and proceed. Uh, the main conclusion of the meeting was that we should, that countries should have a program to do something about gastric cancer, and in high incidence areas that they, the countries should start considering eradication in the context of properly uh, evaluated programs that, that, that take into account all this, all this remaining data that we still don't have. Uh, and then we are, we are also conducting another trial that is, uh, I, I, this is in, in Korea, taking, taking advantage of the screening program there, where we are randomizing to, together with the National Cancer Center of Korea, we are randomizing 
H. pylori positive subjects who come for the screening program to treatment or no treatment. And there, were, there is 11,000 people that are being followed for 10 years. Uh, and then there is another study we're participating in, which is the GSTAR study uh, that is being conducted in Latvia and possibly in other countries. Uh, actually, we have, we're having conversations with several groups here in Russia to, to include them in this study. And this is a, a bit more complex, but basically is, we're randomizing to, an inter, to be part of an intervention or not being part of an intervention. And if you're part of the intervention, we test for helicobacter, and if you're positive, we treat. And we also test for pepsinogens, which is a marker, serologic marker of gastritis. And those with gastritis then follow a special protocol of surveillance, with endoscopic surveillance for I mean, until forever, basically. They have a so, and this is one of, the, one of the other aspects that you do when you do screening, is this surveillance. There is a recommendations for surveillance, and I will discuss in a minute. There is another a huge study in China. It's a follow-up of the previous study, that they, one of the previous studies, where they, they actually uh, uh, recruited 200,000 subjects, and they were randomized to treatment or no treatment. Uh, those who were positive were randomized to treatment or no treatment. And this study is underway. And we're going to have uh, results in the, next, in the next few years. And this is going to shed a lot of light on the, on the potential <laughs> of this intervention. In terms of, of screening, there are very few countries that have actual organized, I mean, that have screening programs. Korea has an organized screening program where they invite everybody to screening periodically. I will give you more details. And it is based on detection of early cancers. I mean, it's to advance the detection and treat the cancers early when they are still almost 90% curable. Uh, however, the impact of population screening has not been proven for, for gastric cancer screening. This is, this is quite important that we still don't have the evidence to say that this is, this is really effective. In Korea, the national cancer, the national screening program includes endoscopic or radiological screening for everyone who is 40 years and older. Everyone uh, is invited every two years for this examination with very high compliance. Uh, and in reality, well, they, they undergo endoscopy and if needed the biopsy, and if the biopsy is positive, they are treated. Uh, this is a, one thing that's important is that in Korea there is a reduction in mortality. The incidence is very stable, but is, I will show you in a minute. The reduction in mortality is there, but it has it started way before, I mean, decades before the screening program started. That's what has made it so difficult to to say that it, the, the the reduction is. A, 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 a consequence of the screening program. This is, this is the classification that is used when you're doing endoscopic surveillance of people who, where you detect abnormalities or precursors. I'm not going in detail. And these are the different schedules that are used, and there is a lot of consensus about what different frequencies to use for, for follow-up when you detect an abnormality during your screening programs. This is, this is what I was telling you. This is the incidence of, of gastric cancer in Korea. Uh, here at the top, the top, the top line in blue is the is the since 1999. It's very, very stable, uh, and the mortality. Uh, it's also blue. There is a decline, but I mean, unfortunately, I don't have the other slide here. But if you go back, it means this decline has been has been ongoing the, since the since the 80s. Uh, in Japan, is another another interesting intervention in Japan is that they they actually now reimbursing the treatment for Helicobacter for everyone who has gastritis and where Helicobacter is is found. Uh, so you have it's not a, a program of screening for Helicobacter and treating the Helicobacter. It's a program where they opportunistically screen for gastritis and and they look for Helicobacter and those who are positive they're treated. That has increased a lot the, the use and the prescription of Helicobacter in Japan. Uh, 
And in, in reality, they're starting to claim that this is already having an, imp an impact, but that's, that's unlikely that so soon, within about three years, we're going to see an impact on mortality. But basically, what they are doing, as I said, is, is treating, if, if you have a helicobacter, they treat you. And if you have, I mean, during the endoscopy, of course, if you have abnormalities, they follow you up. Uh, so in terms of early detection, as I said, it's a highly lethal disease, a very poor survival, except for early cancers. And the alarm signs are often when disease is very advanced, pain, bleeding, weight loss, and melanoma. So in conclusion, gastric cancer will continue to kill millions of people for decades. Cancer control programs must include actions for its prevention and control. There is limited evidence for the impact of screening. H. pylori eradication is a promising intervention, and current research will provide important answers. Thank you. Thank you, Rolando. Uh, may I ask you a question? You, uh, you have demonstrated in several slides decline in incidence and mortality from gastric cancer, which started ages ago, several decades ago before we knew the etiology, before we discovered that helicobacter pylori is involved, before we discovered the effect of the diet, and so on. Before we started, not we, I mean Japanese and Koreans started screening. Could you explain? In fact, uh, uh, my impression is that this decline has we medical profession have no impact whatsoever on this decline. What's your opinion? Why, what is the cause of this decline, both in incidence and mortality? Well, I think it's, it's a sanitation issue. I mean, it is, this is related to hygiene. both hygiene and better nutrition, because on the one hand, there is a, a clear reduction also in the prevalence of helicobacter. I mean, it, it comes together with a reduction in the prevalence of helicobacter that's also happening in the new cohorts. When you look at the age distribution of helicobacter infection, in everywhere, in most places, except in some areas, like Siberia or certain areas or, or some places in the Middle East, it's not declining. But in most places, the children are not getting infected at the same rate as they were. So, and that probably is, I mean, the new cohorts that are coming with lower infection rates are the ones that are getting a, a, a reduced experience of gastric cancer. Uh, but then, I mean, I think it's not only the, I think, in my opinion, it's not only helicobacter, it's probably also the, the more access to better nutrition. Yeah. And I mean, a better diets and more, more, more fruits and vegetables, etc. So, and maybe, I mean, the very traditional foods that may also be causing, a, I mean, like excessive salt and pickled foods that were not so clear, but possibly related as well are sort of diluted now in the diet. They're not like the only thing people eat, like in rural areas in the past, I mean, where people only ate certain things. Now there is much more variety. So I think that's part of the explanation. So we don't have much time. I still would like to ask you one more question. We are living in the country in which gastric cancer is still high. It's declining tremendously, as you have shown yeah. here in your several slides, it's declining. Uh, I just would like you to uh, sort of say again uh, that about the screening, would you suggest screening gastric for gastric cancer in this country? You just told that there is no sufficient evidence to prove yeah, efficiency, yeah, yeah. but I think that in this country that should be... Would you suggest no, I, to I screen would, I, for gastric cancer? I would not suggest screening for gastric cancer because it's, I mean, first, there is, not, there is not evidence. Probably the impact would be very limited. It's extremely complex to organize, expensive, with, with, it requires high technical skills and diagnosis, etc. So it's, it's probably not a very good idea here, but there are other, I think the option of, eradication of helicobacter in certain areas of very high risk. I mean, like doing implementation projects of, of this intervention could be very interesting and, and could, have, could have an I mean, an impact, as I said, not only on the people you treat, but also in reducing the, 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 the contagion of the future of future generations. Okay. 
Occupied all your time. Um, well, let's continue. I wanted to ask you. <laughs> so I wanted to ask you. I mean, it's not only the case for Russia, but it's the case for many other countries that are, that have high incidence of gastric cancer, but maybe not as high as in Korea and Japan. And given that we cannot do screening, but we can do eradication of Helicobacter pylori. But for instance, in Latin America, it's well known that people uh, are um, exposed to antibiotics very early in life and through life. So would that have any impact to start an eradication program there? Yeah, well, there, there is. If you're going to start an eradication program, you have to do a survey to detect the prevalence of resistance to antibiotics. And you define your intervention based on the pattern of resistance in that community. That's basically the way you do it. So you choose your antibiotics based on, on what works there. Yeah. The huge doses are needed, I mean, for eradication, yeah? Huge doses of, of antibi antibiotics, which... Pretty big. Yeah. Yeah. True? Yeah, yeah. Okay. I took it. And it's yeah, you pretty took tough. It. Uh, what, just, one just, more question. Just the last question. In the, in the, in the following all those questions about uh, what do you advise for the Russian Federation. So you don't advise uh, screening. Uh, you probably would advise eradication in some spots, right? What, do you, what would you advise? What would the strategy in the country? I didn't just think... wait until the incidence uh, comes down and uh, do nothing, or shall? No, something. as I said, I mean there is, there is. I mean the the incidence will con will continue to be very high at the burden of disease. So something should be done. There are a lot of dietary interventions that are still pending in Russia. I would say that it's clear from the. I mean, there is a lot of salt consumption. For example, you see salt shakers in every table, and people use it a lot. Uh, there is, I mean, in some places, I'm sure there is problems with distribution of foods and food practices that don't include a lot of fresh vegetables, etc. There is the, I mean, smoking is another risk factor, consumption of alcohol. So all the public health interventions that are general for many other diseases and for many other cancers are going to also have an impact on gastric cancer. And then considering the eradication, in, especially in the, in the very high risk areas. No? That's, a, that's something that really should be actively pursued because it, 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 that, that can really take care of the problem.